The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Let's get started. <clears throat> William Klemperer was, <coughs> was my thesis advisor, and he died yesterday. It also happens that the subject of this lecture is, the, is really the core of what I got from him. He showed me how to evaluate matrix elements of many electron operators, which is the key to being able to interpret, not just uh, tabulate, uh, electronic properties of atoms and molecules. Our goal is to be able to reduce the complexity of electronic structure, which is really complicated. The, the electrons interact with each other really strongly, and there are a lot of them. And it's very hard to separate uh, the complexity of the many body interactions into things that we can put in our head and interpret. And the whole goal of this course is to give you the tools to interpret complicated phenomena. We have the vibrational problem as a way of uh, understanding internuclear interactions, uh, uh, nuclear motions. Uh, we have electronic structure and the hydrogen atom as a way of understanding what electronic structure is and to reduce it to basically the things we learn about hydrogen. When we go to molecular orbital theory, we take what we know about atoms and build a minimally complex, complex interpretive picture, which is sort of a, a framework for understanding complicated molecular interactions. So, one of the most important things about understanding electronic structure is how do we deal with many electron wave functions? One of the terrible problems is that the electrons are indistinguishable. And so we have to ensure that the wave functions are anti-symmetric with respect to permutation of every pair, every pair of electrons, not just two. In helium, we just dealt with two, and that wasn't so bad. But when we deal with n electrons, what we are going to discover is that in order to anti-symmetrize the wave function, we have to write a determinal wave function, a determinant of orbitals, and when you expand an n by n determinant, you get n factorial terms. And when you calculate matrix elements, you have n factorial squared integrals. So you're not going to be handling these one at a time and looking, uh, and looking at them uh, uh, lovingly. You're going to want to be able to take these things and extract what is the important thing about the electronic structure that you're going to need to know. And as a graduate student, I was collecting numbers. I was collecting numbers about spectroscopic perturbations, where non-degenerate perturbation theory breaks down and interesting things happen. But this was something that nobody in the world was interested in, because it was the breaking of the usual patterns. And I was convinced that I had collected some stuff that told an interesting story. And, uh, I told Klemperer about this, and he said, well, have you thought about how to evaluate the, these integrals, that you're, the, these numbers that you are extracting from the spectrum by doing some tricks with the many electron wave functions? And then he showed me on a scrap of paper how to do it, and I was launched. That was it. That has been the foundation of my career for the last 50 years. And I didn't think that Klemper knew that. I didn't think anybody knew it because I didn't think it was to me knowable. But he just gave it to me on a silver platter. And so I'm going to try to give you at least the rudiments of what it is you're up against and how you reduce them to things that you care about, that you can think about. 
And you can understand the hydrogen atom in rather complete detail, or at least you can understand how one observable relates to another. And so the relationship between uh, the effective quantum number and the ionization energy of a state then provides a hydrogen atom based structural model for everything you can observe. Now, spectroscopists have the unfortunate uh, uh, habit of saying we're interested in a structure. Structure is static. Dynamics is magical and special and hard. But if you understand structure in a way which is not the exact eigenstates, not the exact wave functions, but something that the molecule was trying to do and sort of missed. And the, the dynamics is just what happens when this preparation isn't an eigenstate, which would be boring. And you get dynamics, which you can understand, as opposed to just say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tabulate the dynamics too. Still do. You don't know anything unless you have a reductionist picture of what's going on. And since the hardest part of dealing with molecules is the fact that they have a lot of electrons, this is really the core of being able to do important stuff. Now, it's, it's a horrendously complicated uh, problem and notationally awkward too. And let me just try to, uh, let me try to explain it. And I'm going to try to do this without too much reliance on my notes because they're terrible. Um, okay, but we have, we talked about helium. And helium has two electrons. And there's this 1 over R12 interaction between electrons, which looks innocent enough. You can write it down, you know, just a few symbols. But, and we can call it the first order perturbation. But that's really a lie because it's as big as almost everything else. And so, yeah, we can, in fact, uh, do a series of approximations. One is ignore it, the non-interacting electron approximation. And that's basically repackaging hydrogen, and it's not quite enough. And then we can say, OK, let's, uh, let's calculate the first order energy by calculating expectation values of H12. So that's E1. That's, and that's almost enough to give us a sense of what is going on. OK. One over R12 uh, commutator with, uh, with any electron. That's not zero. One over R12 commutator with any, any orbital angular momentum, any momentum is not zero. So that means that L and N are not good quantum numbers. What's a good quantum number? What's the definition of a good quantum number? Come on, this is an important question. Yes. Count, and you put them into some formula, and then you can read off uh, eigenvalues. That's, that's maybe 70% of what I want. You can put it into a formula. That means it's a rigorously good thing. It means it commutes with the Hamiltonian. A rigorously good quantum number is an, uh, corresponds to an eigenvalue of an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian. So hydrogen, we rely on N and L to get almost everything. But here we find that in addition to this being not small, it destroys the foundation of our picture. And so how do we, how do we think that we can make any sense of uh, many electron um, atoms and molecules. Well, 
it turns out we can hide most of the complexity. And most of the complexity is just working out the rules for calculating these matrix elements. The matrix elements of operators that we care about, like uh, transition moments, spin orbit, Zeeman effect, things that, that, that correspond to how we observe atomic and molecular structure. And, and so the main obstacle to being able to evaluate these matrix elements is the permutation requirement. And it turns out that there is a really simple way of dealing with the requirements for electron permutation. And that, that is to write the wave function as a determinant of one electron orbitals. Because a determinant has two, three uh, really important problem, uh, properties. One, it changes its sign when you permute any two columns. Two, it changes its sign when you permute any two rows. And three, if you have two identical columns or rows, it's zero. That's, that's really fantastic. And that is the Pauli exclusion principle, not what you learned in high school. The, what you learned is a small consequence of that. Uh, so if we can build anti-symmetric wave functions, we have alpha. We have we can only put one electron in an orbital. We have all sorts of stuff, but it's too complicated to tell a student in high school that you, you can't, you, just the question of indistinguishable electrons is such a subtle thing that you can't say, well, they have to be anti-symmetric, but it's easy to say you can't put more than one electron in a, in a spin orbital. But we don't talk about spin orbitals. We say we can't put more than two electrons in an orbital because we're protecting you from, from unnecessary knowledge. OK, well, I'm not going to protect you. OK, so we know that the Hamiltonian uh, has to commute with these capital letters mean many electron angular momenta, and this is the spin, this is the projection of the spin. We know this is true because the Hamiltonian doesn't operate on spin. It's a trivial result, but it's a very important result. Okay, so uh, we have to worry about spin and spin eigenstates and other things like that. Okay, so Slater determinants. J.C. Slater was an MIT professor in physics. Uh, he invented these things in 1929. I have a reference. I, I don't know if I've ever read this paper, but uh, it, it's probably beautiful. So basically, what Slater did is showed, yeah, you can, you can do the necessary algebra to deal with any atom. And to be able to reduce an atom to a small number of integrals that you really care about. And there are two ways of doing this. One is the truth, and one is the fit model. Now, the truth is really boring because you lose all the insights 
And the fit model gives you the things you have to think about and understand. And a fit model also tells you what are the important actors, and maybe they're in costume, maybe they're not, but you know, we, can, we can deal with them. But the, the truth is really very complicated. And as I said many times, when you go from hydrogen to helium, you can't solve the Schrodinger equation exactly. This was, a, this was perhaps a little bit of a surprise, but I think it was only a surprise in newspapers. I think physicists knew immediately when you go from a two-body problem to a three-body problem. There's no way you can have an exact solution. And that's the truth. Uh, you can't solve helium or any more than one electron problem exactly. But uh, you can do really well, and it just costs computer time. And if the computer is doing the work, you don't really care. Because once you've told the computer the rules, then it's off to the races. You can go have lunch, or you can uh, go have a life, and come back, and, and uh, the computer will tell you whether you made a mistake, and you're getting a nonsense result, or uh, that you have the correct result. Okay. So, what we know is this permutation operator operating on any two electron function has to make Okay, I'm skipping steps and I've, I my notes are really kind of stupid sometimes. Uh, P 2, 1, which has to be equal to minus. Okay, that's, that's, and now if you apply the permutation operator twice, you get back to the same thing. So there's only two possible eigenvalues. You can have minus 1 or plus 1. And the minus 1 corresponds to fermions, things that have half integer spin, like electrons. And the plus one have, corresponds to things that have integer spin, like photons and vibrons and other things. And actually, it's harder to construct a symmetric function than an anti-symmetric function. But the thing is, you've got lots of electrons. And you have very few quanta of vibrations in a single mode. And you have very few photons interacting with a molecule at once. And so the symmetry of the, the, the boson symmetry is less important in most applications. And so we just have to kill this one. Okay. So suppose we... Uh, I want to talk about something uh, like this, the 1s, 2s configuration. A configuration is a list of the occupied orbitals, not the occupied spin orbitals, which is a, a spin associated with an orbital, which is what I, the world of spin orbitals is where I live, but we, we, we do that for a reason. Okay, and uh, so this two electron thing, can be expressed as a space part <coughs> there are various conventions that Time to spin part. And alpha 1, beta 2, and then we have minus or plus beta 1, alpha 2. I'm looking at my notes because some people always keep the electron in the first position, and some people keep always this. The, the, the orbital in the first position, and it doesn't matter because you can, you can permute rows or columns, but I just want to write what is in my notes. Okay, so 
this thing, this two electron function, has two, uh, has two anti-symmetrized possibilities, and one is a singlet and one is a triplet. So s equals zero, s equals one. We recognize this alpha beta minus beta alpha as the singlet uh, uh, spin state, and alpha beta plus beta alpha as the triplet spin state. So we have alpha beta plus beta alpha, and alpha alpha, and beta beta, and we have alpha beta minus beta alpha. So we call s equals zero a singlet, and this a triplet because of the number of states. And this wave function has, has the necessary spin symmetry and the necessary permutation symmetry. <coughs> okay. So if instead of two electrons we have one, two, dot, 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 n, then Mr. Slater says, we do this. Whoops. One. K. N. One. And then. Sorry. K. One. N. K. N. N. So that's a determinant, an n by n determinant. And the rows correspond to the electrons, and the columns correspond to the orbitals. Now this, because of the properties of the determinant, uh, is anti-symmetric with respect to permutation of any two electrons, or any two orbitals. But we don't really care about the permutation of the orbitals, because it's really the same thing as permuting the electron. And so this n factorial is a consequence of normalization because when you expand an n by n determinant, you get n factorial additive products of n functions. Looks horrible. And because we're normalizing, we need this uh, one over the square root of n factorial in order to have this thing come out to be one when you're calculating the normalization integral. Okay, now this notation is horrible because you've got too many symbols. And so, depending on what you're trying to convey, you reduce the symbols and you can reduce it simply by, instead of writing psi every time, just writing the state. Or you can, since you don't need psi, you don't need the state letter, you can just have the state number. And, but the, the best way to do this is simply to say this is just the main diagonal of the determinant. It conveys everything you need. Again, if you permute any two of these guys, any adjacent pair, the sign changes. And it contains everything you need, and it, and it doesn't require you to, to look at stuff you're not going to use. And your goal is going to be to take these things and calculate matrix of, of them, and so you'll be dealing with the orbitals one or two at a time. And this is very convenient. And soon you start to take this for, for granted that it's a very simple thing, but it isn't because you're doing a huge number of tricks. Okay, I'm going to skip over what's in my notes, demonstrating that for a two by two, that what I asserted is correct. You can do that very easily. And so, okay, so, we can count, and we have an atom, and we know how many electrons it has. 
And so we immediately know what our job is going to be. We're going to be having to write some Slater determinant of those number of electrons. And the goal is to be able to do the algebra in a way that maybe you can't describe to your friends because it's too complicated. I'm, I'm faced with the, the, the problem of trying to explain how to do this algebra. But it, it is something that you can learn and you can ta ask a computer to do it. And there are all sorts of intuitive shortcuts where you can look at a problem and you could say, yeah, I understand. OK. So you're used to orbitals. And that's perfectly reasonable because for hydrogen, we have orbitals. And there's only one orbital. And it could have either spin. We don't mess with that. But now we're going to talk about spin orbitals. And that's just the combination of the name of the orbital with whether the spin is up or down. And the reason for this is it's easier to do the algebra. And the reason the algebra is uh, it, it's initially harder to do the algebra because there are certain, certain selection rules and stuff like that. But once you know how to do it, you do the algebra and then all of a sudden everything pops out in a very useful form. Okay. So the stick diagrams are very important, but now I'm specifying the stick diagrams as spin orbitals rather than orbitals. Now another point. There are rules for how, uh, so we, the number of spin orbitals different between the left hand side and the right hand side of a matrix element. There are rules that are easily described and so for every kind of orbital, an orbital that has uh, 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 that is a scalar that doesn't, doesn't depend on uh, quantum numbers, that has a selection rule delta SO of zero. And for uh, uh, something like uh, a one electron operator, that has a selection rule delta at spin, orbit of, spin orbital of one and zero. And then we have our friend, one over Rij, that has a selection rule delta spin orbital of two, one, and zero. And the algebra for each is something you work out, and then you know how to do it. And I'm going to try to give you just a little bit of a taste of this. OK, so we already looked at something like this, but we, did, we use a slightly different notation. So I'm going to go back, and we have 1s alpha, 1s beta, 2s alpha, 2s, beta. And so for the ground state of helium, it's 1s squared. And we would do this. And I mean, the stick diagrams are great because it, 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 it's easier to see on a picture what are, what are, who are the actors and have I, have I included all of them or have I left something out. And so now we. We're interested in the stick diagram for the 1s, 2s configuration. <coughs> and there are several kinds of 1s, 2s configurations, depending on what the alpha and beta are. So we have 1s alpha, 2s alpha. And we have 1s alpha, 2s beta. s beta 2s alpha 2s alpha 1s beta 2s beta so there's four guys and we can put our arrows on these things and we uh, we know everything we need to know about these guys and we it tells us what to do well when we do this The, the 
diagonal matrix elements of the uh, Hamiltonian, the one over Rij Hamiltonian, can be expressed And we use this notation, J tilde minus K tilde. So for every two electron thing, we're going to get this kind of. Now these are simple integrals, and some of them are zero. Because this doesn't operate on spins. And so uh, the, uh, if, you, if you had a, uh, 1 s alpha, 2 s beta, 1 over rij, 1 s beta, 2 s alpha, then the 1 s alpha with the 1 s beta is 0. The 1 s alpha with the 2 s alpha is not 0. Etc. There are all sorts of stuff, but uh, this tilde notation says well, the, we, this is what we start with, and we have to convert it into things that really uh, matter. So the operation of removing the tilde requires a little bit of work, a little bit of thought, and that's why my notes are crap because I can't explain it well enough to uh, 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 really teach this. But let's just, uh, so, when, when we do the 1s squared, the j1s squared tilde is equal to the j1s squared because the spins take care of themselves. But k tilde 1s squared is equal to 0. Because we, when we, we do 1s squared, we have an alpha with an alpha for the j term and an alpha with the beta for the k term. And alpha with beta is 0 because the operator cannot change alpha into beta. Okay, so, but, so this tilde notation is a convenient thing because you can use any Slater determinant and you can express it in terms of J's and K's and the sign uh, comes from switching the order of the orbitals, that's how de determinants work and, and so you can, you're, you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff but Removing the tildes is the tricky business. Okay, now, when you get a problem where uh, you have a configuration uh, where a single slater is not sufficient, in other words, in order to make an eigenstate of s squared or sz, you sometimes need two or more slaters. And you have to use a particular linear combination of them to get the right value of s and sz. And then what happens is you're looking at matrix elements between, of the 1 over rij operator between slaters. Now this is a headache. And, you know, I could talk until I'm blue in the face and I cannot make it clear that how to do this because it's just awful. But, you know, some things in life are worth suffering for. And so, anyway, in the 1s, 2s situation, when you do everything right, you get... This is just a general notation for a two electron wave function. One over R, one, two, psi, two. So these guys 
are eigenfunctions of S squared and SZ. And when you do that, you get uh, 1 half times 2J 1S 2S minus or plus 2K 1S 2S. Remember, when you have mismatched alpha and beta, the k's are zero. But when you have k, the 1 over rij matrix element between two slaters, you can fix that. And so this is, this is why it's so hard to explain because, you know, yes, I'm, I'm not even going to apologize anymore. Okay, so this is what you do. And the notes are pretty clear about how to do them and what the problems are. But lecturing on it would be a little bit hard. Okay, so now what are we going to do with it? Well, we'd like qualitative stuff and interpretive stuff. Okay, qualitative is Hun's rules. Now, if you looked at 100 textbooks, I think 95 of them will have Huns rules wrong. You're never going to make that mistake. And interpretive, well, we want to know the trends of things. And we want to be able to do something like what you did in freshman chemistry, uh, shielding. Now, you probably memorized some rules about what shields what. And, and, but I'm going to give you a little bit more insight into that. So we're going to talk about this for the rest of the lecture. OK. So you specify a configuration. And this configuration might be two electrons, two spin orbitals, two orbitals, I'm seeing, or three, or 10. And, you know, often when you specify the occupied orbitals, you neglect the filled ones, which is nice because you have fewer things to worry about because filled orbitals have spin zero and they, you don't have to do anything. They're automatically anisymmetrized and they basically act as a charge distribution in the core that is sampled by the electrons outside. And so you need some sort of a, a rule, set of rules for how, do that, how does that work? And that's shielding. But OK, so we first, we specify a configuration. And you also learned in high school, probably, how to determine the L, S, J terms that result from this configuration by some magical crossing out of boxes. And if you didn't, I'm glad, because it would have just clouded your mind and caused earlier insanity than, you know, than MIT causes. So anyway, uh, so we have orbital angular momentum, and we can add the orbital angular momenta of the electrons in following certain rules. And we have spin angular momenta. And J is equal to the vector sum of L and S. And we say we have an LS term, like triplet P. And it can have J is equal to uh, L, plus, uh, L plus S, L plus S minus 1, down to L minus S absolute value. These are the possible j's. And so Hund's rules is all about, of all of the states that belong to a particular configuration, which one is the lowest? One. Which one? Not the second lowest. Which one is the lowest? And why do we care? Because in statistical mechanics, everything is dominated by the lowest energy state. And so, if you can figure out what is the lowest energy state, you basically got as much as most people are going to want. So you want to know what, is, what are L, S, and J for the lowest energy state of a configuration. 
Configurations are typically far apart in energy. So if you know what the lowest energy configuration is and the lowest energy state of it, as far as your friends, the statistical mechanicians, you can tell them how to write their partition functions. And the rest is details, and mostly you don't want details. And if your friends tell you they want details, well, you tell them this is what you have to do, but it's no simple three Kuhn's rules. Okay, so Kuhn's rules. You look at all of the LSJ states that are possible from a particular configuration. And you can use the crossing out of ML, MS boxes if you want. And I could tell you why you would do that, but I don't want to cause insanity at this stage either. Uh, but, you know, I'm an expert at that. And you can also use uh, lowering operators to generate all the states once you know stuff. Okay. So, uh, once you know all the states, Quinn says, which one of these has the largest S? Which one? And that's easy to know. And for example, if you had uh, 2p squared, you're going to get uh, uh, singlet d, triplet p, and singlet s. And, well, here's the triplet. That has the largest s. So the triplet P is the lowest energy state. Now, if there, if there were multiple uh, triplets, as there would be, say, for uh, 2P, 3D, uh, then you'd have to decide which of those triplets is the lowest. And all you care about, all you're allowed to say is which one is the lowest, and it's the one with the maximum L. And then, the last step is, which, what is the lowest J for that LS state? And that's kind of cute, because, you know, so you have the P shell, there's, uh, there's, uh, um, Uh, for for a, a P shell, you can have six P orbitals uh, to fill the shell. Uh, uh, one alpha, one beta, two alpha, I was zero alpha, zero beta, etc. So the degeneracy of a P, electro, P orbital is six. If you have uh, P to n, where n is less than or equal to, less than three, you have a less than half filled shell. And then lowest is j uh, equal l minus s, absolute value. And if n is greater than three, you have the lowest being the highest possible value. J is equal to l plus s. So for l and greater than three. And now, when you have a half-filled shell, the lowest state is, uh, is, is, is usually uh, an S-state with the maximum spin, but it doesn't matter that uh, there's, when you have a less than or more than half-filled shell, you have generally a state with orbital angular momentum not equal to zero, and you have spin orbit splitting of that, and so you do want to care which, what is the lowest j. But when n is equal to three, the lowest state is usually an s state. It doesn't have a spin orbit splitting, and it just has one value of j, which is uh, uh, whatever the spin is. Okay, so Huns rules tell you how to identify without knowing beans what is the lowest energy state? And it's never wrong. And, uh, well, maybe sometimes wrong, but that's because of one of my things where you have a perturbation between states belonging to two configurations. But people get really excited when they discover a violation of Huns rules. And it's just trivial. Um, so, 
there's this. Okay, and then, what time is it? Well, I have a few minutes to talk about shielding, and I will. Okay, so we have a nucleus, and it has a charge of Z. Bare nucleus, there's no electrons, so the atomic number is the charge. And then we have a filled shell around it. It's spherically symmetric. And so if we penetrate inside of it, what we see, suppose we penetrate inside to this point, what we see is only the uh, plus Z minus the number of electrons inside this sphere. Now, if you took electricity and magnetism, you can prove this. If you didn't, you can accept it. And so, outside the nucleus, the charge is plus one because you have a neutral atom. And, and then when you penetrate inside this region of dense charge, and all, spin, all of the spins are generally paired, this is spherical. And you, you, so what you end up seeing is Z effective as opposed to Z true. And let's say here's R0, where this is R0. And so beyond R0, the charge that you see is plus 1. At 0, you see a charge of Z. And so what ends up happening is you get a, a Z effective, which is dependent on distance from the nucleus. And it goes from the integer value that you know from the, the atomic number down to 1 because uh, you've taken one electron away from a neutral atom and taken it outside. And now we have this wonderful thing called the centrifugal barrier. So if we have a state that has a non-zero value of L, well, if we have a state with a zero value of L, it can penetrate all the way into the core, to the, the nucleus. And so that means that the shielding is less for s orbitals. And now if we have a non-zero L, it can't get in so far. And the larger the L is, the, the, less, uh, uh, the, the less it can see this extra charge. So high Ls are very well shielded, low Ls are not so well shielded, and the shielding goes S most, I mean S least shielded, P less, so on. Now there's some other interesting things, which, you know, I hate to say this, but uh, comparing 511.1 or 511.2 to 309.1, uh, there is this business of what happens when you start to, um, so when you have, um, You start with potassium, and so you put an electron in the 4s, not in the 3d orbital, right? Why is that? Well, the 4s sees the, the, the larger charge, it's less shielded. So it goes in, and then when you go from potassium to calcium, you put another electron in this. And that's true. So you, for calcium, you have a 4s squared, and 4s 3d is a higher lying state. Now, you take an electron I'm cooking my, my own goose. Um, if you take one of these electrons away, this is not the way I wanted it to come out, you end up having, uh, you, you find yourself in a 3D state. Because uh, 3D penetrates a little bit under 4S, and you, I can't do, I can't explain it 
in a way that's going to make sense. I really wanted to because I, 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 I care so much about these simple arguments, but I've, I, I, I will just be wasting your time. So the order in which you fill orbitals comes out naturally different from the orbital order in which you remove electrons from orbitals. And the shielding arguments are capable of explaining that. Okay, so this is the end of atoms. And I've asked you to, to, to observe some complicated algebra, which you're never going to do, or at least never going to do much of. Everything you need to know about atoms, you can tell a computer, and it can do it. Now, molecules are much more complicated, and that's what we're going to start on next time. We're going to start with molecular orbital theory. And I'm not going to be presenting the normal textbook approach. I'm going to present an interpretive approach where you understand why things happen as opposed to memorize just symmetries and filling orders and so on. Okay, I'll see you on Wednesday.